So my story today is about uh, multi-scale and also large-scale modeling of resting state activity in uh, two types of primate cortex, uh, that of the non-human primate and that of the human primate, if you will. Uh, the types of uh, models that I will talk about are spiking models uh, resolving individual neurons and synapses. Uh, not everyone necessarily agrees that it's useful to create such models uh, containing lots of neurons and synapses or to focus on cortical dynamics rather than function. So first I will go into the question of why this approach. Um, our large scale uh, models contain uh, many uh, microcircuits. So, first, I will uh, say a bit uh, about those microcircuit building blocks. Um, then, I will go into the models we have developed of um, uh, or are developing of macaque and human cortices. And finally, I will present some of the latest work uh, from my group. So, why large uh, multi scale models of cortical dynamics? First, uh, why do we uh, create models of a basic uh, property like resting state dynamics rather than studying something more interesting? Um, I have come up with this analogy to try to illustrate this. So consider a water strider, one of those insects that uh, walk on water. To explain how a water strider manages to do this, we need to know about a basic property of water, namely surface tension. If we don't know about surface tension, then we would come up with the wrong explanation for how the water strider manages to do this. Uh, for instance, that it's very light, or uh, we might even call it a miracle. And also, if we uh, model the water in the wrong uh, physical regime, say a soapy one, then we would predict that the water strider would sink. Uh, so now think of the water as the physical and dynamical substrate of the brain and of the water strider as the function that rides on top of it. We need to um, correctly describe the basic physical properties of the substrate in the and also in the right parameter regime in order to reach uh, the right conclusions. Um, our uh, models are based on extensive anatomical and physiological data. And with these, we, we aim to enable in silico experiments to answer questions, for instance, about the relationship between uh, network structure and dynamics. And what is uh, currently the situation in computational neuroscience is that a sort of zoo of models um, exists, each implementing different ideas about how the brain might work. Uh, but so far not coming together into um, integrated coherent models capturing a large set of phenomena in a unified manner. So creating integrated uh, multi-scale models enables these uh, models to be validated with the experimental activity data at multiple scales and to gradually account uh, for an increasing range of observations. And uh, the hope is to to gradually uh, sift through the um, various hypotheses about brain dynamics and function that have so far only been implemented in, in um, relatively simplified single purpose models and identify the ones that hold up uh, under these uh, more intense multi-scale constraints. In uh, contrast with uh, what is usually done, our models contain the full density of neurons and synapses uh, in each local circuit, uh, thereby uh, avoiding downscaling artifacts. Um, in particular, downscaling changes the activity correlations between pairs of neurons. Um, it was already previously known that um, reducing uh, the number of neurons tends to increase the activity correlations between the neurons. And what um, we found furthermore is that um, reducing the number of synapses per neuron changes the shapes of the uh, correlation functions between the neurons. Even if you try to make up for the smaller number of synapses by increasing their weights. And that uh, can, for instance, uh, lead to wrong conclusions about 
um, network synchrony, oscillations. It can distort uh, predictions of population signals and of SDDP. And uh, therefore, ideally, uh, models have the full density of neurons and synapses. Um, so now that I hope to have convinced you that it makes sense to create large multi-scale models of cortical dynamics, let's, let's uh, move on to a main ingredient of our models, namely um, the cortical microcircuit. As the name suggests, um, cortical microcircuit is a small um, local cortical circuit uh, that is assumed to form a sort of computational unit in which the cortical layers play specific roles and which is repeated with only minor adjustments across the cortical sheet. Um, this idea has a long history going back um, over half a century, arguably uh, starting with the proposal by Hubel and Wiesel that uh, convergent inputs from the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus um, uh, onto, uh, um, onto simple cells in primary visual cortex, uh, account for their receptive fields and um, convergent uh, inputs from simple cells onto complex cells in turn uh, account for the receptive fields uh, of those cells in, in layer three. Many years later, um, Douglas and Martin uh, created a model where they assumed um, uh, where, where they added inhibitory um, neurons and suggested also the importance of recurrent connections. And that was still a very simple model uh, representing each population by only a single neuron. They also investigated uh, laminar connectivity patterns to argue for the notion of a canonical cortical microcircuitry, a standard repeating motif that can be found with some variations across cortical areas. Since then, uh, many cortical uh, microcircuit models have been developed, studying both their dynamics and their function. And in uh, recent years, uh, in a few cases, containing the full complement of neurons and synapses. And our um, building block is one of these, the model by Pochans and Wiesmann. This is a generic model of a square millimeter of early sensory cortex containing about 80,000 neurons and 300 million synapses. Uh, the neuron model is the leaky integrated fire model uh, with uh, current based synapses with an instantaneous rise and an exponential decay. Each of uh, cortical layers two, three, four, five, and six um, contains an um, excitatory and an inhibitory population of such neurons. And uh, the po populations are connected with layer cell type specific, but otherwise random connectivity of which the uh, connection probabilities are determined uh, from more than 50 experimental studies. All uh, neurons receive a stochastic uh, external drive um, Poisson drive representing uh, the non model parts of the brain. And this simple model accounts for the asynchronous irregular spiking activity observed in cortex in vivo and the realistic uh, distribution of spike rates across the layers and the excitatory and inhibitory populations. The model was first implemented in NEST and it's now available. Uh, in various simulation languages, and we also ported it to the neuromorphic hardware Spinnaker. As a, as a brief intermezzo, I want to uh, mention the work of uh, former PhD student Andre Maximov, um, who derived criteria for validating uh, cortical microcircuit models. Looking at um, experimental data, he, he found that um, neuronal input currents and membrane potentials during waking or upstate activity are remarkably stable in the sense of having small fluctuations. And that may seem contradictory with the usual notion of uh, synaptic bombardment uh, causing large fluctuations compared to in vitro conditions without ongoing activity. However, um, the available 
popular uh, models actually have difficulty uh, capturing the smallness of fluctuations in combination with the high excitability of cortical circuits. For instance, um, the balanced random network model um, of Brunel um, is not excitable um, in the sense of showing um, activity sustained for a few hundred milliseconds after a brief stimulus, while the Osterich um, adjustment of this model uh, with larger synaptic strength captures uh, excitability, but it predicts excessive um, uh, current and membrane potential fluctuations. Um, Andre gathered these and other criteria to hopefully in future find a model that fulfills all of them simultaneously. Um, also, the model of Pochans and Diesmann does not capture everything. Um, it, for instance, misses slow activity fluctuations that are seen in resting state spiking activity in visual cortex. And being a model of only um, a single area, it cannot account for um, coordinated activity between multiple areas as uh, seen in uh, fMRI resting state networks or uh, for propagation of activity across areas as here measured with uh, EEG. Here uh, in this study, the subjects either uh, watched movies or they performed um, uh, visual imagery. Mm, remembering movie scenes or um, imagining riding a bike without pedaling to a destination of choice. And it turned out that in the latter condition, there was relatively more propagation of activity or more influence from um, parietal to occipital areas that is like uh, going um, down the visual hierarchy. And uh, since uh, visual imagery uh, might be closer to the resting state con condition than the perception condition, um, it suggests that we should also expect more feedback than feed forward propagation um, across areas in the resting state. Um, with our uh, multi area model of macaque visual cortex, uh, we hope to address these issues. We chose this uh, model system um, in view of the availability of rich uh, experimental data sets. The model was uh, mainly developed by former PhD student Maximilian Schmidt. Um, yeah, and another reason for choosing this model system is um, because uh, modeling the macaque brain can form a stepping stone towards the human brain. Um, the vision related areas in the macaque contain on the order of 800 million neurons in one hemisphere, and they can be parcelated into 32 areas which are not all purely visual, but are somehow involved in vision or, or strongly connected to, to visual areas. And this includes then um, occipital areas like uh, primary and secondary visual cortices, temporal and parietal areas involved in uh, motion processing and object recognition, and also prefrontal and parahippocampal areas that are involved in eye movements, attention, memory encoding and retrieval. Um, because 800 uh, million neurons are still too many to simulate routinely, we start by representing each area by a square millimeter microcircuit, um, leading to a total of about 4 million neurons connected via 24 billion synapses. And we ran the simulations um, on the Ulysses supercomputers using NEST. The um, vision-related uh, areas of uh, macaque cortex are connected in an approximate hierarchy that can be defined based on laminar connection patterns. Feed-forward connections um, originate mainly in um, um, supergranular layers two and three and terminate in layer four of the target area. <laughs> And feedback connections uh, originate mainly in infragranular layers five and six, and they terminate 
outside layer four in areas at the same hierarchical level, the connections have a bilaminal origin and a columnar termination pattern across all layers. <clears throat> and then one can define a hierarchy that is as consistent as possible with these pairwise connection patterns. However, um, due to uh, some deviations from the stereotypical laminar patterns, there's some indeterminacy in the positions of the areas in the hierarchy. And um, one way of resolving this um, indeterminacy is uh, to define an art, um, hierarchy based on the local site architecture of the areas. Um, So-called Architectural types um, characterize the neuron density and distinctiveness of the lamination of cortical areas. Primary visual cortex V1 is a laminate area with dis distinctive layers, a high neuron density and a thick layer four. And going up the hierarchy, the neuron density decreases and the layer four becomes thinner, eventually disappearing altogether in a granular areas. As opposed to uh, neuron density, the volume density of synapses remains roughly constant, so that in higher areas there are more synapses per neuron. Um, architectural types are relevant for us because we need to determine the population sizes in each area and layer, and um, specifically for areas for which the neuron densities were not directly measured, we can estimate them from the architectural types. And then we multiply um, the neuron densities with the total cortical thickness and the relative laminar thickness to uh, compute uh, the number of neurons in a given area and layer. So we adjust the Fortran's and Gizmar microcircuit model for each area accordingly. Next, uh, we need to determine the connectivity between the areas. Um, for this, we use axonal tracing data um, collected in the COCOMAC database and from the lab of Henry Kennedy. The COCOMAC data are, uh, are mainly qualitative, telling us which areas connect to which. And the data from Markov and Kennedy are quantitative, uh, measuring the fractions of labeled neurons, or FLN, in each area sending connections uh, to the area injected with the retrograde tracer. These data are, are extensive, but they're still incomplete. So we need some statistical regularities to complete them. And uh, one trend we use is that uh, the connection um, density, uh, the ethylene, uh, decays approximately exponentially with the distance between the areas. And um, and then we end up with this area level connectivity matrix, according to which uh, roughly two thirds of area pairs are connected. But what's more important is that the connection density span approximately six orders of magnitude, which we need to take into account. Now we, uh, we still have the cortical layers to worry about. Uh, some Quantitative information about uh, laminar connection patterns is available in the form of um, fractions of supragranular labeled neurons, or SLN, from uh, retrograde tracing studies. Um, the SLN measures the proportion of labeled cells in layers two and three uh, relative to the cells um, labeled across all layers. And because the uh, data are not available for all area pairs. Um, we again estimate the missing values through a statistical fit, this time against um, the logarithm of the ratio of the neuron densities of the pair of areas involved. So when the target area has a higher neuron density than the, uh, than the source area, this ratio is positive and um, the connection goes, um, goes down the hierarchy emanating uh, mostly from the lower cortical layers and vice versa for uh, connections going up the hierarchy, which emanate mostly from the upper cortical layers. 
Um, for the uh, target side, we also have some information about laminar patterns, and some of this comes from anterior grade tracing studies collected in, uh, in the Coconut database. And the rest we can uh, guess because of the association between laminar source and target patterns that I uh, showed before on the slide uh, on the cortical hierarchy. So for instance, connections that originate in layer two, three, that uh, they tend to target layer four. But, um, but these laminar patterns, these target patterns describe uh, the location of the synapses uh, rather than of the cell bodies of the target neurons, which may be in a different layer. Than, than where they receive the synapses uh, you know, on their on their apical dendrites, for instance. So um, to associate synaptic locations with the locations of the target cell bodies, um, we uh, we need morphological reconstructions. We use this data set from Binsecker of CAT-P1 morphologies because it is the, it was the only comprehensive layer-specific data set available didn't have such a data set uh, from a CAC, unfortunately. And um, we then assume that the probability for a synapse to be established on a given type of neuron is proportional to the total length uh, of its dendritic tree in the given layer. And um, putting together the area and layer specific uh, connectivity, we arrive at a connectivity map for all the areas and layers in our model. Finally, we are ready to turn on the simulation, and uh, this uh, initially leads to a big disappointment uh, because the firing rates were either uh, too low or way too high, uh, hundreds of spikes per second. Of these uh, two states or, or fixed points, the uh, low activity state is the most realistic, but the um, spike rates in the excitatory populations of layers uh, five and six are almost vanishingly low. And this uh, gray here means that they uh, disappeared altogether. Um, naively, um, we would just increase the external Poisson drive to these neuron populations, because we anyway don't know exactly what the value should be. Um, however, unfortunately, this quickly leads to the high activity state again. So we have to do something smarter. And um, this leads us to uh, mean field theory. Uh, we use the mean field theory to describe the average activity of each population and uh, gain more systematic insight into the parameter dependence uh, of the activity. This um, enabled us to, to change the connectivity slightly in order to uh, allow increasing the external drive onto the excitatory populations in layers five and six without immediately end up ending up in the high activity uh, state again. How this works is uh, illustrated here. Um, initially, we, we have a, a state with too low activity and um, we also have the high activity fixed point here and a separatrix between the basins of attraction of these two fixed points. When um, we increase the um, external drive onto 5E and 6E, then we improve the low activity state, but also the separatrix moves closer to it so that in the simulation where we have fluctuations, we uh, quickly go across this uh, separatrix and end up in the, in the high activity uh, state, which we don't want. So through uh, minor changes in the connectivity, um, Jan Schuker and Maximilian Schmidt were able to move the separatrix back to, to each, uh, its original position. And um, this uh, only slightly changes the activity in the low activity uh, fixed point again, but it's still, uh, the firing rates are still reasonable. And the global stability is now improved because the separatrix is far away and so fluctu fluctuations won't drive the system quickly to the high activity state. Um, and one um, connectivity change that uh, was uh, necessary to achieve this or is predicted by this method is a reduced um, connectivity between dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the frontal isolate. 
Now um, we have a reasonable ground state of activity, but if the um, synapses um, between the areas have the same strength as within the areas, the model still doesn't uh, show the slow activity fluctuations that are present in the experimental data. Instead, uh, the activity looks very much like that in the isolated microcircuit. So to obtain the slow activity fluctuations, we increase the uh, strength of the inter-area synapses uh, through this parameter uh, chi. Um, it turns out we have to increase the synaptic strength onto inhibitory neurons more than onto excitatory neurons in order not to end up in the high activity state again. And there is a sweet spot around chi is 1.9, where the activity shows a mix of uh, short and long fluctuations, the same mix that is present in the experimental data. Increasing chi further, uh, the network spends more and more time in the high activity state. So um, the network needs to be poised just below this transition to the high activity state. Um, and this corresponds to a well-known uh, phenomenon of dynamical slowing near an instability. Um, the network uh, state approaches the instability, but uh, it never quite crosses it. I, um, I should mention that uh, the brain probably has mechanisms to prevent it from ever crossing that boundary, except in pathological conditions like epilepsy. Uh, some stabilizing mechanisms that we haven't included in our model yet. Um, so this type of um, activity with, uh, uh, with slow fluctuations, it does not um, occur in the model of a single microcircuit, so, and it's due to the multiple microcircuits being connected together. The resulting activity looks, some, uh, looks like this for uh, three example areas out of the 32. Uh, so primary visual cortex, secondary visual cortex, and the frontal eye field. Um, the spikes of the excitatory neurons are shown in blue, and those of the inhibitory neurons are shown in red. And um, the spike rates and the uh, activity correlations between the neurons are generally low, like the cortex and the spiking irregularity is close to that of a Poisson process. And um, the average firing rates of each area fluctuate on short and long time scales. We um, assess the agreement between the simulated and experimental data from primary visual cortex. The uh, experimental data contain intervals with uh, less or more symphony. The overall uh, spectrum uh, looks like the yellow curve, and for the uh, simulation, it looks like the black curve, and you see that the overall decay is well captured. There's only um, a bump around the beta frequencies in the simulated data. Um, we also looked at the distribution of time averaged uh, spike rates across neurons. The yellow curve um, for the experimental data is now barely visible because it's so well matched by, by the simulation in black. If we um, model um, stronger inter-area synapses or weaker ones so that we are go away from the, yeah, the transition between the low, and, uh, low rate and high rate states, then we don't uh, match this um, distribution anymore. So we really need to be poised just below the instability. We also uh, looked at the order in which uh, the activity propagates across the areas. Analogously uh, to the hierarchy based on structural connection patterns, we determined the hierarchy based on the pairwise orderings of the activations of the areas. That is, um, we look at the correlation function for each pair of areas and see whether the peak occurs at positive or negative lag. Um, so indicating which of the areas tends to be activated first during the ongoing activity. And then we ordered all the areas in such a way as to minimize the number of violations of these pairwise orderings to obtain a unique sequence in which the areas tend to be activated. 
Um, the video shows the spike rates of the areas uh, over time with warmer colors indicating higher rates. And it turns out that the parietal areas are activated first. Um, um, followed by the temporal and uh, occipital areas. And then finally, a peak in the activity in the occipital areas is, uh, is followed by trough in the activity of the frontal areas. And uh, uh, the ordering of the parietal uh, before the occipital areas corresponds to the feedback propagation observed in the EEG experiment that I mentioned in the beginning. Finally, um, we looked at functional connectivity between areas, um, uh, comparing the correlations between the simulated synaptic inputs to each area uh, with uh, fMRI functional connectivity. And this comparison reveals a match that peaks very close to the strength of inter-area synapses where the microscopic spiking activity is also most realistic. And also, um, this match is as good as one can expect based on the variability across the monkeys, uh, which is encouraging. We have made the entire source code for the multi-area model publicly available, and there's even a corresponding instruction video available on YouTube. So um, emboldened by this uh, small success that we had with the macaque model, our next goal was to apply the knowledge that we gained uh, to human cortex. And this work is being done by a PhD students, Alexander von Megan and Yari Konold. Um, here we uh, consider an entire hemisphere rather than just the vision related areas. But still, uh, the model has a similar size as the macaque model because we use a coarse of parcellation. We use a desiccant Kiliani atlas. And um, an important difference, however, is that uh, the neurons receive about twice as many synapses per neuron. The area and layer specific neuron densities are taken from this uh, quite old study by von Economo and Kostinas. And uh, we adjust the neuron parameters according to data from the Allen Institute. And again, we investigate multi scale resting state activity. Here, uh, we cannot use uh, tracing data, of course, because it's invasive. So we use uh, connectivity from uh, diffusion, diffusion tensor imaging. And uh, the layer specificity of the connections is predicted from uh, relative neuron densities of source and target areas using the statistical regularity observed in macaque. We also, again, uh, map um, the cortical cortical synapses to the target neurons um, using morphological reconstructions here of, of human neurons. Um, this only determines the, uh, the layer specific connectivity statistics, and we still use point neurons. By, um, by increasing the uh, local synaptic strength for uh, I to E connections, we don't need to adjust the connectivity uh, like we did for the macaque model to uh, obtain reasonable firing rates. We, we again. Um, scale the cortical cortical synaptic strengths and investigate under which conditions the microscopic and macroscopic activity resting state activity is best reproduced. Here we uh, consider distributions of firing rates and irregularity from single unit recordings um, from uh, human medial frontal cortex um, where um, yeah, the, we measure the irregularity in two different ways using the coefficient of variation of the intraspike intervals and, um, and uh, the revised local variation. The uh, resting state fMRI uh, comes from um, 19 subjects. Uh, it's, it was obtained at Maastricht University. Um, we, uh, it was kindly provided by Mario Zenden. And um, our preliminary simulation results uh, show that all these quantities um, 
are again best reproduced just below um, a transition from a low to high activity state. And that happens um, without any tweaking and thus seems to be a really robust result. So well, um, finally, I want to briefly present some uh, further uh, recent results and uh, ongoing work. Um, in a study uh, led by uh, Johanna Zenk, uh, we have recently uh, reviewed the use of uh, connectivity concepts in neuronal network modeling and tried to um, bring some order into the use of terminology and, and network diagrams by pro proposing unified concepts and a, and a corresponding graphical notation. Um, we found that um, the population level connectivity rules used by computational neuroscientists, they still tend to be fairly um, limited, fairly simple. Uh, for instance, uh, pairwise Bernoulli connectivity, where each uh, pair of source and target neurons is considered once. And the connection is established with the probability p, according to a uniform uh, random um, sampling. And um, we also found that um, the descriptions of connectivity are uh, not always complete, and thus they they don't always allow uh, others to reproduce the result fully. And we hope that our um, proposal for describing and, and displaying connectivity will help make models more reproducible. Another uh, nice recent uh, study was performed by, uh, mainly by Vahid Hostami at the University of Cologne. And this um, work considers joint clustering of excitatory and inhibitory neurons via connection strengths. Um, as opposed to existing models that uh, consider um, EI networks with purely excitatory clustering. Um, but he showed that this, uh, this type of clustering is able to account for variability dynamics in macaque motor cortex during a reaching task, and also for uh, uh, performances measured with uh, response latencies in such a task. And um, it does so by supporting winnerless competition in which uh, different clusters are activated at different times. Whereas um, with uh, purely excitatory clustering, the, the winning cluster tends to remain active for a very long time. And uh, other improvements uh, with respect to purely excitatory clustering uh, are shown here. So uh, selected clusters, they keep a moderate firing rate and asynchronous irregular activity consistent with, um, with cortical, cortical activity because, um, because the inhibitory neurons, they provide a really local balance to the excitatory neuron. Um, we've also uh, begun to incorporate such clusters into our macaque multi-area model and are finding that it it also improves the uh, spiking statistics there um, and also um, helps um, obtain inter area propagation. A final uh, study I want to mention is by Alexander von Megan on uh, so called intrinsic timescales. This refers to the widths of um, single neuron autocorrelation functions. So, visual areas. Um, have been found to exhibit a hierarchy of such time scales, with the autocorrelation widths um, increasing away from the sensory periphery, so going up the visual hierarchy. The different colors here was, um, represent different experimental studies. And this um, property of intrinsic time scales is, is thought to be important for information processing in different temporal windows. So, for instance, um, Hasson and um, colleagues performed an uh, fMRI study where uh, subjects watched uh, silent films, either forward, uh, backward, or piecewise scrambled in time. And uh, the responses in early visual areas like B1 and MT plus were um, 
were not disrupted by the scrambling, whereas the responses of higher areas depended on uh, the accumulation of uh, visual input over longer periods of time. Um, Alex uh, developed a dynamical mean field theory of, um, of spiking uh, networks in the asynchronous irregular regime uh, that's able to accurately account uh, for the single neuron time scales um, and also other uh, the dynamical properties of the single neuron activity. Um, the theory uh, solves the problem of predicting the temporal structure of the spiking output of neurons receiving colored noise, uh, which is necessary in order to predict these time scales. And um, since the time scales found in the experimental studies are often quite long, much longer than the time scales of the individual neurons, so the membrane time constant. We, uh, we looked for long time scales in the modeled networks. And uh, comparing networks of weak integrating fire neurons and networks of generalized linear model neurons, Alex found that the mechanisms for long time scales are different in these two types of networks. So for networks of uh, weak integrating fire neurons, the long time scales are associated with a prolonged silence after spikes, whereas for networks of generalized linear model neurons, they are associated with an increased probability of spiking uh, after a spike. So, um, yeah, uh, I say long time scales for these models, but they, they were at most uh, two to three times the memory time constant or so. And uh, they did not yet, yet uh, reach these quite long um, intrinsic time scales um, found in the experimental data. But nevertheless, this uh, theory provides a new tool for studying intrinsic time scales in the brain. To summarize, um, using large scale spiking neural network models, we're able to reproduce microscopic and macroscopic aspects of cortical dynamics. We consistently find that the networks have to be poised just below instability. And uh, the exercise of constructing these networks exposes gaps and novel regularities in anatomical data uh, and thereby um, increases our insight into cortical organization. Um, joint clustering of excitatory and inhibitory neurons via their connection strength um, supports local balance and thus uh, realistic uh, asynchronous irregular state. Besides being able to account for variability dynamics and task performance motor um, in a motor cortex model. And um, ultimately, uh, with our type of modeling, we hope to contribute to taming the model zoo, in part by uh, supporting reproducibility. And our models can uh, form a basis for uh, models of information processing in the brain. <clears throat> uh, this work would not have been possible without uh, my wonderful group members and collaborators. So I am very grateful to be able to bask in their reflected glory. And um, I also profited from the Human Brain Project, of course, and the pro uh, Priority Program Computational Connectomics of the German Research Foundation, as well as uh, computing time provided on the Ulrich supercomputers. Um, with that, I, um, I thank you for your attention and I welcome any questions. <laughs>